Matthew chapter 2. <clears throat> True worship is putting God in the center of your life. I think that's what Christmas is all about. It's a reminder to us to get Christ back into the center. Uh, though the, uh, the society tries to pull us away from that and, and focus on the materialism, but in reality, Christ should be the center of our lives. But in this, not just on Christmas Day, but on all the 350, you know, two days of the year, uh, Christ should be the center of our life. He should be the focus. And so he is the one we worship. He is the one that we focus on in life for direction, for our necessities and for the things that he gives us. Matthew has been focusing on Jesus as being a king of the Jews. And so that's the theme of the whole gospel. And I'm going to repeat that periodically as we go through this so, so that we do remember that, if anything, from the gospels of Matthew. Following the birth of Christ, Matthew narrates several key events in the earliest days of Jesus' life. And so he gives us, after the announcement, after the genealogies, after the evidence that Jesus is the Messiah, these events are not found anywhere else in the New Testament that portray important truths. Matthew wished to communicate about the meaning of Jesus. Uh, the first of these events we'll find are the Magi's or the wise men as we call them visiting Jesus there in Bethlehem described in verses 1 through 12 and we're going to take a, a few weeks to describe that to you today. We'll look at verses 1 and 2. Then we're going to look at 13 through 23 uh, tells us of Jesus's journey from Egypt and back as well as the decision to make a Nazareth, the, the Nazareth, their home as childhood. Throughout chapter 2, Matthew points out the way in which God's purposes from the Old Testament find fulfillment in these events. We'll look at verses 1 and 2 with the Magi seeking to worship Jesus. Now, when I got saved, one of the concerns that I had, because I came from a religious background, I was born into a Catholic family, and we had gone to church every Sunday, every Sunday. And of course, uh, Saturdays, once in a while, we, we would go to, to Mass so that we could have confession. And my mom would make all of us go to the confession. If you don't know what confession is, basically you, you sit uh, in an area where there are booths on the side of the, the building there, and there's a priest in the booth. And you wait your turn. And as soon as someone comes out and, and no one's going in, you, you get in there and, and you basically confess your sins to him. You apologize for not you know, coming sooner. Maybe it's been a year or two years, for some people 10 years since your last confession. And, and you confess these things. And, and then he gives you the little sign of the cross and, and he tells you, okay, this is your, your acts of contraction, you know, your penance. You know, this is what you need to do when you leave. And so usually for me, it was like 20 Hail Marys and, you know, 20 Our Fathers. And so then you would go out of the room and you kneel down before the, the cross and so forth and you start repeating the Our Fathers. And so you'd have to go through the Our Fathers 20 times and the Hail Marys 20 times. And so to me, that's what religion was. Now, though, though I believe it's incorrect from my findings and reading the scripture today, it did lay a foundation for me because within Catholicism they do have some of the basic fundamentals correct for instance that Jesus is the son of God and that he's God and that he was born of a virgin and that he came to die for our sins and he resurrected on the third day so there's a foundation that they laid but when I came to Christianity and, and all of the um the, the negatives that the church put upon the people because if you go outside of the church, there's a possibility that you're, you will die and go to hell because you're not a part of the church. And so they kind of put that fear in you. And so when I got saved, I asked Christ into my heart and then be my Lord and Savior. One of the questions that I asked him was, are you really the right way? A am I getting into something that is wrong? I really need to know that I'm headed in the right direction, that you are God, the foundation's already been laid in my life, that, that he has to be God, he can't be a man, 
He's got to be greater than a man because a man can't die for my sins. Otherwise, I'd die for my own sins. And so you, you really need to give me the evidence so that I know for sure that I'm headed in the right direction. And so I immediately began to read his word and the spirit of God began to illuminate his truth to me. And I realized there was a certain point in my life that I realized this is the right way. Periodically, I get a little fearful because there were some things that were strangely different. But then coming back to the word and realizing it's God's word and realizing that it's truth and then saying, I have to accept what it says here more than what I feel here. And so I learned to do that. So I know that he's God. I know who I believe in. What we have here today is some wise men who know what they believe in, who are willing to seek it out, who are willing to give up of their time and their efforts and resources to seek out this king. And I believe that if we truly seek God with our heart, he says, you will find me. E e even if we know nothing and we seek God, God with our heart, I believe that you'll find him because he sees a sincerity that's in our heart and he knows that you really want to know the truth. You really want to know who God is and you want a relationship with that God in the right way. And I think that you find God. And so we come to wise men. That's the theme. And so let's read verses 1 and 2 of chapter 2. Now, after Jesus uh, was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. Come to worship him. Now, the main point here in chapter 2 and uh, focus, again, uh, in, in these few verses, tw uh, 12 verses or so, the, the point is going to be worship. That's the main point of all. Uh, who worships the king? Who worships him sincerely? And who worships him falsely? And so we see these wise men worshiping the king. And then we see Herod within the, the storyline here who does not really worship the king. He, there's an ulterior motive there on his part. And we'll look at that next time we meet. So after Jesus was born there in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, and it's mentioned here, and, and we'll talk about him later, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. Some translations like the NIV use magi, which is probably a better translation. Bethlehem, also called Ephraim, is located five miles south of Jerusalem. When I was in Israel and I stayed in the Rochelle, it was a Shabbat uh, home there where college students stayed, an interesting place, I could actually see Bethlehem from my room. I, I wanted to go down there so badly, but they, they really uh, encouraged us not to because it is, it is a Muslim quarter to this day. And it's not, uh, there are no Jews there and so forth. So it's kind of dangerous to go down there. And so um, didn't get to go down there to see where, where Jesus was born, but you could basically see the little city there in Israel. Bethlehem means house of bread, which is interesting because Jesus later on in John tells us that he is the bread of life. And yet he was born there in, in Bethlehem. How fitting. It was his birthplace, uh, a birthplace of King David, the original city of Joseph's ancestors. And Bethlehem is known today as the birthplace of Jesus Christ. According to Luke chapter 2, 1 through 7, Joseph and Mary traveled uh, from Nazareth to Bethlehem to arrive at a stable or possibly a cave where Jesus was born. Now, it was the days of Herod, Matthew tells us. Now, Keep Herod in mind, and again, next week we'll talk more about Herod, and we'll look at him a little closer. But Herod was appointed to a position by the Roman governor because he was so cruel that he could literally keep the Jews in line. So, so the Roman government was using Herod as a tool to keep peace and order within the community. This is Herod the Great. He was a short little guy from tradition. 
uh, he had a probably an ego problem. And, and so that's probably why he pushed his power around a little bit because he was a short little guy, probably about four feet tall, as they tell us. And so it's understandable that uh, he lived in a big man's world and he wanted to be a big man. And so he tried to push his way. Uh, he was also known as a great architect. Uh, he did some great work there, uh, rebuilding the temple refurnishing it, aqueducts within the city, Caesarea, uh, making pon uh, ponds and pools and so forth, um, did some Roman work there, so he was very well known, very well liked, uh, did some, some great work there in the area. He literally built Masada. If you know where Masada is in, in Israel in the desert, it is an amazing place uh, where some of the Jews had, had, had climbed this uh, mountain peak to keep safe from uh, the, the Romans. Um, the place was self-sustainable. Uh, water actually flowed up to it and they could get it to survive. Pretty amazing place. The only way that the Romans were able to, to penetrate this fortress and mountain peak was to actually build sieges. So they, they literally took dirt and started laying it up against the side of the mountain until they had enough dirt that they could just go right to the tip. A lot of dirt. When you're on the ground, you don't see these siege places, but you're up there on Masada, and you look down, and you could see where the dirt started, and they started to pile it up uh, towards the mountain. That's pretty amazing when you think about it. You need a lot of manpower to be shoveling dirt in buckets and start dumping them. They didn't have bulldozers. They didn't have big trucks. They just started shoveling the stuff up against the mountain. Pretty, pretty big feat to, to accomplish, and, and they did uh, kill. Actually, they committed suicide up there before the Romans could, could get up there. So the, he was a great architect. And then Matthew turns his attention to these wise men. And he says in verse 1 there, Behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. Philip's translation also says a party of astrologers or magi. So if you think of the word astrologer, you think of someone who studies the stars. And, and that's what these guys were, were star studiers. And they studied them and they, they looked for signs and so forth. The word magi in the Greek word used by Matthew puts it in English letters. And so there are several references in the Old Testament to magi. We find it in Jeremiah. We also f uh, find it in chapter 39 along with uh, Jeremiah chapter 50 where the word magi is used. Um, there is a inscription within the Babylonian writings concerning these magis. They believe that these magis were probably Greek from Persia there. And so they probably understood Daniel's prophecy of the 70 weeks. And they had an understanding of these prophecies, and so they were looking for these signs. So generations had passed, and they continued to look for these signs because they knew that these signs were leading to a king who would come to rule the world as astrologers. It was in Numbers chapter 24, verse 17 where Balaam gave a prophecy. And maybe they were familiar with this prophecy. It said, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. He will crush the foreheads of Moab, the skulls. Speaking of the star of Jacob, which would mean the Messiah, and so they were experts in studying these stars. They were waiting for the sign. And of course, we know in the story that a star all of a sudden appears. And we'll talk more about that in a couple of weeks. Uh, what was that star? It was a divine star from the Lord. Now, a couple of things that we notice as we read the text here. The Bible does not call these wise men kings. Nowhere does it say that they're kings. You won't find that anywhere. And yet in, in secular advertisement, we find that they're portrayed as kings. 
and they really aren't. That's one thing that, um, as I shared with you earlier, I want to know the truth. I want to know what the Bible says. I want to know what God has revealed to us. And those little things, though they're not big things, you know, okay, so we think they're kings. That doesn't, gonna, you know, that's not going to affect our salvation. But for me, that is kind of a big thing because I want to know what the truth is. They weren't kings. They were just astrologers in, in Chaldea there. And they were looking for a sign. Uh, they had some wealth. And they were going to bring this wealth to this king in honor and worship of him. And so we can't consider them to be kings, even though our society says that they possibly may be kings, but we really don't know. It doesn't say that they were kings. Nor does it tell us how many there were. It doesn't say there were three, does it? And you can't find that either. More than likely, there were probably an entourage of them, maybe even a hundred, uh, to travel all that way across deserts, across danger, where there was no water. There were probably a lot more than, than just three in itself. Listen to what these magis asked in verse 2. Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. Now Matthew gives us again the introduction here to the whole story. So verses 1 and 2 is that introduction uh, concerning Herod and then the Magi's. And then he will give us some details in, in the next uh, 10 verses or so, which we'll go over in the next couple of weeks. But these kings actually were inquiring of a king of the Jews. So they knew that this king that was to be born was to come from the lineage of the Jews. So they had an understanding of genealogies. They had an understanding of King David and the lineage of David and so forth. And, and it fits within Matthew's gospel as he's presenting the message to the Jews. And so they're looking for the king of the Jews. For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. That's the key here the worship. These men, magis, had no doubt in their mind that a king was to be born. They knew something spectacular would be happening. And they followed that knowledge with their heart. And because they had that knowledge, and they knew it in their heart, they went after it. That is faith in action. They had understanding or wisdom, which is knowledge applied, and they sought after that truth. That is what faith is. When a man has faith like that, God can use that person in a mightily way. God can help that person in a great way. God can heal in a great way. I've seen it. I've seen people who have been ill and they've accepted that illness and it passed away. I've seen people who have been ill who have not accepted the illness but have called on God by faith that you will heal me because you are faithful, because you are good, and because I'm seeking you and really pour their hearts into that healing and trusting in God and I watch God heal them because of the faith that they have in God. See, God will give us what we desire. And if you desire that, that you want to go, then guess what? God will say, okay, it's time to go then. Not all the time. I mean, God may have a purpose for you. But generally speaking, I've seen people with hardships who murmur and complain and struggle and continue on with those hardships. Then I've seen others who take the knowledge of, of everything they're going through and looking at the impossibility of it, but trusting in God and calling out on God in hopes that God will somehow do a miracle. And he does. He does a miracle. He does the impossible. Because that's the God we serve. I believe that, that God wants us to sit at his feet and to ask him. That's why James says, you have not because you ask not. Yeah. 
And I think there's something that connects us with faith in God when we sit there and we ask him and we're at his feet and we're talking to him and we're spending time with him, we're worshiping him, we're praising him, we're thanking him for everything that's going on that he says, I'm going to work in you. Because people see that around you, the community of the brothers and sisters, and they see your faith and they see how strong it is and then God answers and they go, wow, I want that too. So God works a bigger thing out. And so there's something to be said about people that have the knowledge here, but yet the heart to say God can do a work through this. We have to have faith. And if we seek him by faith, he'll answer us. So they saw this star in the east. Uh, They were in the east and saw the star. So evidently it led them westward uh, to Bethlehem. And again, I'll talk about that a little bit later because some have thought, well, what what kind of star was it? A supernova? Was it Halley's Comet? You know, know, all of those natural events, just kind of like the the movie um, um, Exodus that just came out. I mean, if you go see that movie, I, I, I say don't waste your money. I went and saw it because I like to see things firsthand so that I can talk about it and know that I was there. But everything is based upon natural events and no divine intervention of God whatsoever. I mean, the, the, the first plague started with a bunch of crocodiles uh, eating some fish and animals and then somehow the boat tipped over and he, they started eating the, uh, the people and then the blood just kind of went all over the place. It had nothing to do with Moses coming down and saying, here's the first plague. It's from God. It was just a natural event. You know, that's humanism, humanism at its core. No, this star literally guided them right to Bethlehem. That's a supernatural star. But notice that they come to worship him, and that's where I want to spend some time, at least the next 15 minutes. They come to worship him. My prayer, and especially as a pastor, and I believe any pastor, is really to get people to worship Jesus, basically. If we can really worship Jesus, make him the center of our life, make him the focused, uh, wanting to know truth and how we live our lives around him, I think that that the church would grow and gain strength and society would change. If we can get right back to what it means to worship the Lord and making him first. One translation says, Uh, interprets the word worship as adore really adore him honor him love him the magi's had more than just a a passing interest of this king you know we just we we know there's a king let's go see this king and let's acknowledge the king no there was more than just that it was we want to worship this king because this king is a special king and so they did not travel all that way out of curiosity, but they came to worship him. Their desire was to worship the king, and God granted that desire. Again, there's the faith. If you have the desire to know God, to love God, to adore God, and worship him, God will allow you to do so. He'll allow you to do so. I shared this, I share it quite often, and I'll share it again, but I remember when, when I wanted to, to sense God's love. Uh, I, I just wanted to feel it, just, just for, you know, as amount of time, whatever God wanted to give me, and I was, I was just praying and seeking God for days. Lord, I just want to know you closer, I, I want to draw closer to you, I want to sense your love, and, and I was on the 60 freeway headed towards LA, and I was just praying and singing to God and and I just again said Lord just show me your love just just let your love pour on me and at that moment God began to pour his love on me I sought him for a while I, I wanted more of him and I think when you want more of him and you're seeking him guess what he'll give you more because he loves that he loves to give we have a God that gives all the time The only reason that we don't get is because we don't ask or we don't have the heart to seek. But he's a God that gives and keeps on giving. When we look at verse 11, we see on verse 11, they were coming to the house and they saw that the child was his mother Mary and they bowed down and they literally worshipped him. The word worship there means to fall down. 
literally fall down. And there are times where we need to fall down and worship the Lord. Really get on our face, you know, lay down. You ever done that? Uh, times when I come here early in the morning and no one's here, I'll, I'll just lay up here and I'll literally on my face, my legs out, my arms out, and I'm just praising him and worshiping him. That's what the word means. Now, did they fall down like that? Could be. It also could mean bow down. And so they were bowing down. Uh, uh, some customs were where they would kiss the king in, the, in, in a manner where their hand was covering their mouth and they would kiss in honor and respect and an adoration toward him. In reverence, very important that it's in reverence of who he is. His character is holy, it's pure, and we come before him. I think that's why John tells us, confess your sins. And when we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. And, and we can come to the holy hills with clean hands, you know, and a clean heart before the Lord in reverence of who he is and welcoming him respectfully. And so that's what the word means there. It's an expression of reverence and adoration that we should have towards the Lord. That's what these men had. So what we should have as Christians is a desire and a hunger to reverence God and adore him. Adore him above all things. I think of the word adornment and how we adore our, our children or in my case, my grandchildren. I love my grandchildren. I was looking at T.A. She's the second to the last of my eight, eighth grandchildren. And she is changing. She's at that age where, you know, a week or two, all of a sudden there's a difference there. Her, her face is a little rounder. Her eyes are a little more open and she's just smiling a little bit more. She's not as grumpy and, you know, and it's just, I, I just can look at her and just, wow, she's just so beautiful. And I just adore her. You know, and I'll go lay with her. Just yesterday we're laying down and she goes, I'm going to make you an account, Poppy, on my what is it, DS or something like that? Okay, so she put me down as pop, P-O-P, you know. And we sat there and we played basketball hoops. You know, you throw those little basketball hoops into the, those baskets into the hoops, you know. She's showing me how to do it and so forth, and I beat her. <laughs> I adore her. We should adore Jesus. We should adore our Lord. That's what the word means. But do we? Is our hearts bent towards the Lord? Do we think about him? Is he the first thing we think about in the morning when we wake up? Is he the last thing we think about when we go to bed? Is he the center of our lives? Well, what is worship? What is it really? Is it a song? I mean, we, we heard that last song, and I love that song. Uh, the story behind that song is a, is a beautiful story. The man who wrote the story, and I can't, his name just slips me right now. I'll find it for next service. But there was a point in his life where we're worshiping was just songs to him. It was just mechanical. It was religious in a sense. And he realized that there was no heart in it. And so he wrote that song because of that. I just want to get back to the heart of what worship really is. It's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you. And that really changed his whole focus of what worship was. So it's not a song. It's not a hymn. It's the heart and attitude that we have towards the Lord. We've seen it kind of evolve throughout the years. Uh, the 1,500 years from the days of Abraham to the times of Ezra, we saw great changes in the forms of worship. Abraham, who was basically a nomad, headed to the land of Canaan and promised that God had given to him in his uh, revelation, basically built altars. And he would sacrifice upon these altars, you know, in certain places. And that was a form of worship to the Lord. In fact, when you go to Genesis chapter 22, and he talks about the sacrifice of his son, you know the story, where God called him to sacrifice his son Isaac on the altar. And Abraham was asked, where are you going? And he says, we're going to go up and worship the Lord. Uh, obedience is a form of worshiping the Lord, a sacrifice unto God. By the time worship came around to Moses, Moses literally built a portable tabernacle prescribed by the Lord exactly how it should be built with God in the center of it and the tribes all around it, a form of worship. By the time Solomon came around, the temple became a permanent place. 
a beautiful place, probably, probably never as beautiful ever again. Herod got close, but probably not as close as Solomon. And it was a place that they would come into the temples, into the courts, the treasuries, the holy of holies, and offer up sacrifices and praises unto the Lord until 586 when the Babylonians came in and they totally destroyed it. And then they rebuilt it. Herod did as best as he could as an architect. But in AD 70, they came in, Titus, and totally destroyed it, took all the gold and everything from it. And to this day, there is nothing there but a wall. And they call it the Wailing Wall. And today, the Jews go to the Wailing Wall with their heads covered in reverence of God, and they worship the Lord there. They worship the Lord those little kippahs they put on their heads and they have kippahs for for Gentiles that come and want to go up to the wailing wall and they'll put put those on your head and you can actually go up to the wailing wall. You can write your little prayers on a scroll and you just stick it into the crack. And that's how they would worship the Lord. I didn't write a little prayer or stick it in there, but I went up there just to, you know, experience that, which I didn't get any goosebumps or anything, but it was a neat experience to see everyone else there and uh, putting their little scrolls and you see paper scrolls all over the place because they're worshiping God. They're, they're asking for things. They're praying or praising him. The Jews reverence that wall so greatly they will literally go out through the, either evening or night and they'll take all these scrolls and they'll put them in a box. They won't you know, destroy them because these are prayers to God and they'll store them. They'll store them somewhere. I don't know where, but they store them in reverence of God. And that's what we have today as far as, far as worship is for the Jews. Now, worship is commanded by the Lord for us. When Jesus was tempted by Satan in the wilderness in Matthew chapter 4, he told Satan, away with you, for it's written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So we are to worship God, but service comes along with that worship. So songs isn't it. (laughs) True worship is also service to the Lord. And I believe that everyone should be serving the Lord in some capacity. The New Testament gives us little instruction on music, on what kind of music, what kind of church music or Christian music that we should have. Uh, It doesn't give us examples of it at all. It, it, it records songs like Mary's song there in Luke chapter 1 when she sings a song to the Lord. I mean, she just sings that unto God. It becomes canonical, part of the gospel of Luke, as a song to the Lord from her heart. That's worship. Zacharias also had a, a song, became a benedictus of his, again, from his heart. We do have hymns in the New Testament letters in Ephesians, Philippians, uh, Timothy, uh, what they consider small hymns. We find in Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. It didn't say what hymns, but probably the old Psalms is what they were probably singing. And these were forms of worship and adoration to the Lord. But worship is more than a song. It's more than a song. Look at these magis. When, when we study these magis here in its context, Uh, They were astrologers. They were magicians, probably, students of the occult. Uh, Rich, they left home, they traveled far. They were endangering their own lives. They were, and yet they were open to God's leading and they were determined men. They're considered to be Gentiles, not even Jewish. And yet they came to worship this king. And they didn't come to receive anything. They came to give. They came to give gifts. And this is the first mention in in Matthew's gospel where they are giving gifts to the Lord. Giving of their resources, of their materials, of their income, you, you could say, unto God, but not receiving anything. Turn to Romans chapter 12. It's right in your Bibles. Another great example of what worship is. Paul writes this letter to the Romans. He talks about our responsibility 
towards God. He says in, Ro- in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, now he's talking to believers, and that would be us today, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Now this is a form of worship. And this is a plea of Paul to the believer that they present their bodies as a sacrifice. And we saw that in the Old Testament from Abraham all the way to the temple that they offered up sacrifices as a form of worship and reverence and honor to God. But what happens today is that now we are the temple of God. He dwells within us. So God requires a sacrifice today, but not of a lamb, but of our own selves. We are to offer up ourselves as a sacrifice, a holy sacrifice. And we are holy because Christ dwells within us. And it's our reasonable service. He's not asking us to do something unreasonable there. We don't have to cut an animal. We don't have to go and pay a lot of money. We don't have to be inspected. We can basically offer ourselves as a sacrifice. What he's saying here is, I am available for you to use me, Lord. I will be a sacrifice unto you. Wherever you want to use me, wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it unto you. Notice what he says in verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's how you find the will of God for your life. As you offer yourself up as a sacrifice, you separate yourself from this world and you make Christ the center of your life and then he will direct you. He'll put in your mind direction and insight and you'll know the perfect will of the Lord. And then he goes on, for I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to, but but think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. And so he has given us all a measure of faith. We're a part of the body of Christ. Not one part's better than another. We're the same. If anything, think of the other person more highly than you think of yourselves. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differ according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them if prophecy, and then he names all the gifts. So worship is an act of service, not necessarily just a song. And God wants the body of Christ to be active in service. You can turn back to to Matthew if you like. As a church, we offer those opportunities to serve the Lord in various ministries so that you can worship the Lord with the gifts that he has given unto you. Now, we have a system here, and most Calvaries do. As I speak with other pastors of other Calvaries, they they usually have a six-month waiting period so that we get to know uh, one another. <clears throat> and so we have this system here to get to know you, you get to know us, the various ministries, the commitment, um, where you came from, uh, make sure that you came from a good place, you know, uh, make sure that we have an understanding of the fundamentals of Christianity, and we're all on the same page, the same purpose, we all have the same heart, and then we begin to allow those that God has equipped and gifted in certain areas to use those gifts according to the scriptures so that they can also worship the Lord together as a body of Christ. That's how it works. So these men with these gifts, now they have literally gifts to give him, which is another form of worship. They traveled far to give him these gifts. The psalmist talks about service and gifts throughout the psalms uh, psalms 29 2 uh, says in the splendor we're to worship the lord in 
of his holiness. Psalms 86, 9, they will bring glory to his name, those who worship him. Psalms 95, a beautiful psalm, you all know it. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Psalms 100 says that we're to worship the Lord with gladness. All filled with forms of worship. And so the Magi's who have come to worship the Lord in gladness, to worship him in holiness, in psalms and so forth, have also come to worship him with their material things. And so we see the Magi's, the first Gentiles, coming to worship Jesus. And sadly enough, we'll see next week that Herod's soldiers are actually seeking the life of Jesus to kill him, who were Jews. And that's sad. We find in John chapter 4 what the true meaning of worship is. In verse 23, he's talking to the Samaritan woman. And of course, he's revealing to her, you know, her life story basically. And she realizes that this man's a prophet of God. And she's talking about worship. And this is what the Lord said. The hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. So two things there that encompass worship, that we seek the Father to worship him in spirit and in truth. In spirit and in truth. And if we can do that, then we truly are worshiping the Lord in spirit and in truth. Well, what does that mean to worship the Lord in spirit and truth? Well, in spirit, in our whole being, in our mind, in our thoughts, in our actions, and with our heart, we are to worship the Lord, but not just our heart. See, some people think, well, let's just worship God when our hearts feel good. And and when I'm singing that one song that I like, you know, there's always a song you like, you know, and it's just, oh, that one gets me right there in the center of the Lord. I just feel him so much. And and that's wonderful and that's great. But a Beatles song can probably do the same thing, (laughs) you know. And so you have to have truth in there. And so when you worship him, you worship him in spirit, but also in truth according to his word, how he has prescribed for us to worship him. So we should worship with a concern for the spiritual being of who we are, but also concern for the truth and what truth is. We consider his character and who God is and how we are to approach him. And we are to approach him eagerly and expecting from him to receive it and also to enjoy it. In the Old Testament, when they'd offer up the sacrifices, it's like having a barbecue to the Lord. And he says it's like a a sweet-smelling aroma. And he he literally, the the scriptures describe God with huge nostrils, you know, where he just sucks it in and says, oh, that's so good. That's how the Lord receives it. He just loves the worship that is of spirit and truth. It's what the Father expects because he's a Father of Spirit. Let me close. God is Spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in truth and spirit. And that is our task this morning. That as we seek to worship God, let's keep in mind that it should be in our spirit, with our emotions, with our feelings, in our intellect, but also it needs to be also in truth, according as he has prescribed in his scripture. The essence of true worship must be on God's terms in accordance to and with his nature. The point that I'm trying to stress here is the fact that worship is not worship when detached from the word of God or the spirit of God or the love of God. They all work together as we worship God. So my question is, do we really worship God? Is he really the center of our lives? Because that's who God is seeking. Those who are willing to make him the center of their lives in worship. This morning, if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, 
then I'd like to give you an opportunity to ask him into your heart. Maybe he hasn't been the center of your life and you've walked away. <clears throat> he's been kind of on the sidelines and once in a while he's there. No, he needs to be the center. And this is your opportunity. So as we're going to pray, I'm going to ask the worship team to come up and then we will partake of communion together as a body of Christ. Bow your heads if you just need to reconnect with the Lord. You just need to get back to the heart of worship. It's all about Jesus. And I want you to just raise your hand and I want to just pray for you right now that you get back to that point in your life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now, if you don't know Jesus Christ, if you've never asked him into your heart, then just raise that hand. I want to pray with you. Let's all repeat together. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. I believe in the work that you have done through your Son, Jesus Christ. It's all I need. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Give me a hunger to know you, Lord. To worship you and you alone, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.